This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Um, uh, welcome to Gerke Grenzer's uh, third and final SAGE lecture, although Gert will be here until the 30th of April. So uh, he's right there in the third floor of Psychology East if you want to come make an appointment and come talk to him. Uh, it's, he's a wonderful person to talk to. I, I highly recommend it. Uh, this week his new book just came out, uh, Risk Savvy, How to Make Good Decisions. And um, I think that that is what he's going to tell us today. So Gert. At the beginning of the 20th century, the science fiction writer Herbert George Wells made the following prediction. If we want efficient citizens in a modern technological society, we need to teach them three things. Reading, writing, and statistical thinking, that is, a good way to deal with risk and uncertainty. Now, today, almost 100 years later, we have taught in the Western world almost everyone to read and write, more or less, but not to think with risk and uncertainty. A TV newscaster once announced the weather the following way. The probability that it will rain on Saturday is 50%. The probability that it will rain on Sunday is also 50%. Therefore, he concluded the probability that it will rain on the weekend is 100%. <laughs> we smile at that. But do you know what it means if you hear that there is a 30% chance of rain tomorrow? 30% of what? I sent my postdocs back to their home countries in many countries in this world, downtown, to ask people what they think it knows. So I live in Berlin. Most Berliners believe that it means that it will rain tomorrow in 30% of the time, that is, seven to eight hours. Others think it will rain in 30% of the region. That is most likely not where I live. Most New Yorkers believe both is nonsense. And it means something quite different. Namely, that it will rain on 30% of the days for which this prediction has been made. That is most likely not at all. Now, are people confused? We have a large literature in psychology that likes to point out one cognitive illusion after the other one. But the problem here is not so much in our brains, but in the experts who have never learned to communicate risk in an understandable way. In this case, to make clear to what class the 30% refers. Time, region, days, and if you have a little bit of imagination, you can invent another class. For instance, one lady in New York said, I know what 30% means. Three meteorologists think it rains and seven not. <laughs> <clears throat> the solution to this confusion is quite simple. Namely, always ask, percentage of what? But we don't teach that our children in school. We teach them lots of things, but not to think with uncertainty. We teach them the mathematics of certainty, not the mathematics of uncertainty. So we are causing, in part, what we are now observing. What I'm going to do today is to take two themes of my, this book, Risk Savvy. And the one theme is that understanding risk and uncertainties 
can save more lives and prevent us from more disasters that many technologies can do. That means we should invest in people, not just in technology and bureaucracy and stricter laws when something happens. The second theme uh, will be about the difference between risk and uncertainty. In my first lecture, I talked about uncertainty. And the tools for uncertainty uh, are heuristics and a few other tools. In the second one, I talked about risk in the medical context. And here, uh, probability theory can help when we can calculate the risk. Uh, but risk communication is the problem, as we just saw. So the second uh, part of this talk will unify and bring together the two previous talks, and particular talk about the confusion between risk and uncertainty. So the idea that we could reduce all uncertainty to risk. And that's what most of the social sciences are doing. The idea that probability theory is the rational standard for everything. That will be the second part. So I'll start with two examples. The first one is about risk communication, how uh, not understanding basic concepts in risk communication causes unnecessary fear and severe consequences. The second example will be about uh, unconscious rules of thumb that make us fear of specific things and that are probably the product of our history of human evolution, but when we understand this much better, then we can actually deal better with them. Okay, so are you ready? Then we'll start. <clears throat> Great Britain has many traditions, the queen, the tea, the scones, but also a few less tasty ones. <laughs> One is the contraceptive pills care. Since the 1960s, British women are frightened every few years with news that the pill, the contraceptive pill, causes thrombosis, that is, uh, potentially life-threatening blood clots in the legs or in the lungs. The most uh, famous scare went this way. The British medical institutions sent about 190,000 letters to doctors and pharmacists and called in a press conference for the following news. Study had shown that the third generation contraceptive pill increases the risk of a thrombosis by 100%. 100%, that can't be more, isn't it? It's certain. Many British women went into panic and stopped the pill immediately, which led to unwanted pregnancies and abortions. What had this study shown? How much is 100%? The study showed that out of every 7,000 British women who took the previous generation pill, one had a thrombosis, which increased to two among those who took the third generation pills. So in terms of an absolute risk increase, it is one in 7,000. In terms of a relative risk increase, it's 100%. Relative numbers are frightening, but if the news would have reported the absolute numbers from one to two in 7,000, then probably no single woman would have panicked. And most would have thought, why are we told this? What you see here is the Sunday Times reported on this care, kiss of death. Is the pill doomed? That's the 100%. 
This single news caused an estimated 13,000 abortions in the following year in England and Wales, 13,000 more than usual, and particular high among teenagers. But it should be an easier thing to explain every teenager the difference between an absolute risk, one in 7,000, and a relative risk, 100%. But it's still not the case. Little emphasis is in making people risk savvy, having strong people in our society who can take their life into their own hands. If something happens, if a crisis is coming, then we call for better technology, for uh, more bureaucracy and stricter laws. One thing here for better pills, one thing that doesn't occur to us are more risk-savvy people. Second example, I guess every one of us reminds, remembers where he or she has been on September 11, 2001. And it seems to be that everything has been said about these tragic events. If you look at the 9-11 Commission report, you will find in 60, 36 pages huh, all that you want to know about Al-Qaeda, about the possibility of prevention, about uh, bureaucracy like homeland security that was coming, on technology like uh, yeah, full body scanners, and legal issues so the further restriction of our individual freedoms. One issue that's not covered in this book is risk savvy citizens. Why is this important? Imagine it is the year 2001. It's December. And you live in New York and want to fly, want to get to Washington. Would you fly or would you drive? Who of you would fly? Half of you and the others would drive. We know that many Americans stopped flying after 9-11. What did they do? Did they stay home or did they jump in their cars? I looked at the transportation statistics and found that for 12 months after the event, the miles driven increased by about up to 5%, in particular there, where long-distance travel is happening on the interstate highways. As a consequence, in this time, an estimated 1,600 Americans died on the road in the attempt to avoid the risk of flying. The figure shows the number of fatal crashes uh, per, um, so above and below the monthly average and this is September 11. That amounted at this time to about 3,500 on average. And you can see there is a variability. And after 9-11, for 12 months, the actual uh, fatal crashes were in every month above the average and in the most of the times above the five-year uh, variability of the preceding five years. And then it went back to normal. And if you sum this up, then you get about 1,600 people who died on the road. And that's about five times as much as those people who died in the four fatal flights. Terrorists strike twice, first with physical force, and the second time through our brains, arising our anxiety. What is the anxiety that our, that the terrorists exploit? It is a certain kind of fear. And one can uh, formula, formulate this in the following way. If many people die at one point in time, react with fear and avoidance. Note that it's not about dying per se. It's about dying together with many others. If the same number of people or more 
die distributed over the year, it's very difficult to elicit fear in us, as in car driving, motor biking, cigarette smoking. And it's probable that this type of fear that I call dread risk fear is a, a kind of fear that was once rational at a time where humans lived in small groups, maybe 20 to 150 people, and where the sudden death of a part of the group was a threat for the survival of the rest. But that is no longer a real danger in our society where we are no longer dependent of these kind of small groups. Nevertheless, it's very easy to elicit this anxiety. Think about the anxiety that Americans and Europeans had were for uh, mad cow disease, for SARS, uh, of swine flu, bird flu, and so on. All these alarming news where some scientific groups predict huge amounts of death that never occur, and where we then are frightened, at least as long as TV shows the story, and then it's gone. And we all worry, we will worry about the next one. That's the same type of anxiety that we have. So let me go back to my question. Assume you live in New York, you want to go to Washington. And the choices you have is flying or driving. The only goal you have is to arrive alive. Question, how many miles would you have to drive so that the chance of dying is the same as in a non-stop flight? So how many miles do you have to drive so that the, change, the chance of dying is the same. Is there anyone who wants to make a guess? 3,000, 3, yeah. Anyone more? One million. One million. You're very optimistic, right? <laughs> more? 300. 300? 10. You have not much trust in your driving abilities. <laughs> But actually, you have the best estimate. The best estimate we have is 12 miles. Mm -hmm. So that means if you arrive with your car alive at the airport, you probably have the most dangerous part of your trip already behind you. <laughs> so risk savvy in this example means a combination of talents. One is, and we just had some idea about the real statistics. And that it's not a million, but it's rather 12 miles. But second, it also means a kind of understanding of the own psychology. Here, the dread risk fear. That is a, a certain kind of fear that's easy to elicit in us. And it's not about dying, per se. It's about social dying with many of us in one point of time or in short of time. And combined with that kind of fear, you can help yourself and your dear ones not to risk your lives. So when I published this article on the 9-11 uh, uh, situation, a professor from Loyola University wrote me a letter and said, I'm always telling this to my wife. And I told her again, it didn't do the trick. Now, uh, I don't think it's a good advice if a spouse tells the other spouse what to fear. <laughs> <laughs> but, so what to do in this situation? No, one thing would be try to, to just think about the real dangers. But if that, not, that doesn't help, uh, then you can still try to find another emotional anxiety and play it against your fear of flying. For instance, in that case, if the professor would have been a little bit smarter, and rather than telling his wife <laughs> what to say, but uh, telling her, look, we might think about the life of our children. Do you want to risk that? And here one could play 
an anxiety, an old anxiety, parental, uh, against the other one. And that's at least some chance. So we are not lost with destiny and evolution. We still have a brain, and the brain can use different um, fears to play them against one another. So that was my short first part. And the part was about the following point. Uh, if we would start to teach our children, to teach adults, hmm, uh, to become risk savvy, hmm, we could not only uh, prevent abortions, save lives, but and also lead a better, uh, be better in control of our lives. And also we would see that the often heard message that we are hopeless when it comes to uh, risk is not true. We can do something. At least we can try. And uh, finally, I believe that this is a vision about a democracy where the people are strong rather than the government is strong or someone else or some experts that tell us what to do. So everyone can learn to become risk savvy, everyone who dares to know. And also, if you think that there are experts around like bank advisors or doctors or other experts or financial advisors, then remember that many of the experts, including the meteorologists we had at the beginning, do not know or have never learned how to communicate risk in an understandable way or even do not know what the risks really are or have conflicting interests. So pursue other interests than yours. You have to think yourself. In the second part, we come to a key theme, risk versus uncertainty. With risk, I mean risks that can be calculated, like in the casino or in many medical situations where we have good estimates of the numbers. With uncertainty, I mean risks that can not be calculated. Why? Because we do not know all alternatives or all consequences or the probabilities. And these are situations like uh, whom to trust, where to invest your money, what to do with the rest of your life. And the point is that we need different tools for these two situations. If we have calculable risks, then probability theory or logic is enough. You just calculate and then you know what the best thing would be to do. But in most of the situations, and particularly in the important situations we deal with, we don't have the statistics, and then we need more. And that's intuition, and that's heuristics on which intuition is based. And again, heuristics is not something that's always unconscious. Heuristics can be used deliberately. So what is an intuition? An intuition is defined as a judgment that appears quickly in consciousness, but whose underlying process we are not fully aware of. Yet, it nevertheless guides much of our professional and personal decisions. An intuition is based on, usually, on lots of experience, but we cannot explain it. It's not a sixth sense, it's not a uh, God's uh, messages, and it's also not something that only women have. We also have intuitions. <laughs> What's the opposite of intuition and heuristics? It's the reasonable, so what's usually called rational decision making. And I illustrate here the key idea by a letter that Benjamin Franklin wrote to his nephew about how to make good decisions. And uh, he basically tells in this letter that if you are in doubt, then sit down, take a piece of paper, make a line between the options, and take a few days or nights of time and write down all reasons for and against. And then weigh all these reasons and make the calculation. And Benjamin Franklin meant this very seriously. As you can see, 
in the last sentence, which reads, by the way, if you do not learn it, I apprehend you will never be married. <laughs> May I ask you, who of you made a pro-con list to find his or her spouse? Hands up. I see no hands. Recall, this is rational theory, rational choice theory. It's today called expected utility maximization, in which most social scientists believe, particularly if you're an economist. I have many friends who are economists, with whom I work and publish. I've, most of them are male. I've asked them, how did you find your wife? Did you use your own method? The answer was no. I ask, isn't that important enough? Yeah, the answer was no. But I have to admit, I found one economist who said, of course, I did that. Do you think I went to a disco, got drunk, and didn't hear anything and get hooked? No. <laughs> he explained me what he did. He said, I'm, I listed all the alternatives. I didn't ask how many. <laughs> all the consequences, such as, uh, will she let me work in peace and take care of the children? <laughs> then I estimated for each of these women, the probability that that will happen, <laughs> multiplied it with the utilities and did the calculation. And then he told me that he proposed to the women with the highest expected utility. A rational man, isn't it? And she accepted. He never told her how he chose her. <laughs> yes, they are divorced now, yeah? But <laughs> many people are divorced. That's not my point. My point is, this is a brilliant method, but you need to use it in the right domain. That's the domain of risk. In the domain of uncertainty, it may or may not work. You do not know. And the, I had another friend of mine who had two women, one too many. So two girlfriends, exactly one too many, and they knew of each other and the clouds were coming up on the horizon. <laughs> and he did the same thing. He sat down and listed all the pros and cons and did the computation. And when he saw the result, something unexpected happened. He felt it's not right. And he decided for the other women. So what this calculation did for him is to give him access to his own intuition, the decision that has already been made, yeah, which was protesting. He could have done this much easier than sitting down two days and doing the calculation. So if you are in the situation that you need to choose between two partners or two jobs or anything else, just take a coin and throw it. And while it's spinning, you probably feel what not should happen. So you don't have to even look at the result. That's the frugal way to make these decisions. So let's move into the world of business. <clears throat> I have been working with a number of large international companies which have to make decisions like, shall we set up the factory in Shanghai or not? So big decisions. How are these decisions being made? So I asked the, uh, the decision makers from the lower level of the managers up into the executive board. How often do you rely on your gut feelings in decision making? Precisely. A manager is typically covered with, from a mountain of information, um, partly contradictory and partially, you ask yourself, why did I get this information in the first place? And then there's no algorithm to make this decision. If the person, based on his or her experience, has a gut feeling what to do, that's what meant. So what do you think? What proportion of the uh, top managers in this huge international company Base the decision at the end, at a gut feeling. What do you think? 
two percent more? Seventy. Mm -hmm. Anyone more? Here's the answer. So what do you see here? That's the hierarchy in the company. And uh, a group executive is uh, responsible for a few billions. And the interesting thing is nobody says, I never yeah, base decisions on my guts. And also nobody says, it's always my intuition. And both is quite rational. On average, 50% uh, of all important decisions, and these are professional decisions, are based at the end yeah, of the much analysis yeah, on something that their intuition tells them. But the same group of top managers would not admit this in public. There's fear. Fear admitting that one would base uh, one's decision or these decisions on, on one guts. Yeah? Would you want to be told if you have the stocks of this company that they man what they really do? Or would you like to have the illusion that some big data has been analyzed? I've observed two techniques uh, that managers use to hide that they're relying on their gut feelings. The first is to look for reasons after the fact. Uh, so that is typically um, one uh, has an employee and sends her two weeks to find the reasons. And then the decision is presented to the public as a database decision. There's a more expensive version of that. You hire a consulting company which will deliver a 200-page product hmm, justifying your gut decision without mentioning that term. Both of these is a waste of money, a waste of time, and a waste of intelligence only because we have not a uh, reasonable relationship to good intuitions. The second method is even more expensive. It's called defensive decision making. So in this case, uh, a top manager has the feeling that Option A would be the best thing to do for the company. But if something goes wrong, she cannot explain it by definition. So she recommends not option A, but a second best or third best option that can be defended where she is not accountable if something goes wrong. This is called defensive decision making. In other words, defensive decision making protects the decision maker and hurts the company. What do you think? In how many cases in this company defensive decision making happens? And again, this is a the way we got this data was through a person who has the trust of everyone in this company and could do these anonymous interviews. Otherwise you get zero. Hmm? What do you think? What proportion of decisions are made against the best interest of the company to protect yourself? Here's the answer. Now the distribution is quite different. It's flat. There are some who say never. That means uh, that they always will try to vote in the best interest of the uh, company. Here the interests of the company are aligned with the interests of the decision maker. If you talk to them, then you get answers like that. If the company is in good shape, I'm in good shape. If they are not in good shape, then I'm also not in good shape. This is the kind of employee you want. On the other side, there are people who say that almost every one of their decisions, they propose and follow options that are not in the interest of the company, but protect themselves. And interestingly, those are typically in the lower levels of the hierarchy. On average, about a third to one half 
of all decisions are defensive. That means they hurt potentially the company only to protect the decision makers. You can see that defensive decision making is a key problem in business today. And that's not the only company. I've done this with many other companies. Uh, and it's a typical picture. The only type of company who has almost no problem with defensive decision making, also almost no problem with standing up to their gut decisions, are family businesses. Here the interests of the individuals and the company are usually aligned. Um, defensive decision making is a larger problem in our society and it is also a problem, for instance, in healthcare. If your doctor, if you visit your doctor and think that your doctor tells you the best thing for you to do, you may be lucky because you have a good doctor, but many doctors, they uh, practice defensive decision making. That means to protect yourself, as a, to protect the doctors against you, the patient as a potential plaintiff. In the US, there is a study with over 800 doctors. They were asked whether they um, engage in defensive medicine, and 93% said yes. Typically, unnecessary imaging diagnostic, unnecessary uh, antibiotics, unnecessary surgery, and so on, because patients would not likely sue if too much is done. That's the situation. So, uh, <clears throat> let me summarize that part by linking it to innovation. So how to slow down innovation? Here are a recipe with three points. Always mistrust gut feelings. Second, require a rational justification of every new idea. Otherwise, it doesn't count. And third, create a culture of defensive decision making. If that looks to you as a parody, then just go into a business. And we also have a similar development in academia, where uh, innovation is not always fostered, but I would say often uh, made more difficult by emphasis on quantity as opposed to quality counting of articles and citation rates, as opposed to reading the papers and finding out who really has good ideas. And uh, so we're running the same danger in, in these, in these uh, areas as in other areas. What we need is a much more culture that uh, is also able to deal with these anxieties and with gut feelings, and rather than putting the emphasis on procedure, whether it's something that can be explained or not, the emphasis should be on the result. And I'd rather have someone who has good intuitions and cannot explain it, how he got there, hmm, than someone who can explain everything, but there's no idea in shooting distance. So. Let's move on. Again, on the distinction between risk and uncertainty. We have in many parts of academia the illusion that all risks, or sorry, sorry, the illusion that all uncertainties could be reduced to risk. That's typically when people think that probability theory could explain all mental functioning or might be the solution to all of these words. The illusion that something that is uncertain can be calculated uh, has a name. It's the turkey illusion. It goes at the end back to a uh, book by Bertrand Russell. So why is it called turkey illusion? Assume you are a turkey. It is the first day of your life. A man enters, and you fear he kills me, but he feeds you. On the second day, 
the man comes again. You fear, he kills me, but he feeds you. Third day, same thing. By any mathematical model, be it Bayesian or what else, huh? the probability that he will feed you and not kill you increases every day. On day 100, it is as higher than ever before, but it's the day before Thanksgiving and you are dead meat. The turkey didn't have an important information. The turkey illusion is probably less often committed by turkeys than by people. <laughs> Remember the last financial crisis. Before 2008, the predictions of the rating agencies, of the banks and others, of politicians that will move on, get better, better every year, that was the same thing. The mathematical models are basically the same thing. They can just predict what happened in the past and project that in the future. Um, I'll give you now a concrete example of the Turkey illusion. Every year, every end of year, the largest banks in the world predict the exchange rate for the, uh, for the end of next year. Um, here we have, among others, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, uh, UBS, and HSBC, and so on. So these predictions about the uh, exchange rates, dollar, euros, are important for people like us, academics, who want to, you want to travel to, to Europe and, uh, <clears throat> and know when it's the best time to change your money, or companies who need to put this into their projection of the future. So it's a good idea to know when it's the best time to exchange. And top managers pay dear money to get these predictions. So if something is expensive, it must be good, isn't it? I was looking how good they actually are. And I analyzed uh, 10 years of predictions. And here is the result. You see on the y-axis the 12 months forecasts. In December 2000, the forecast was that on average, the exchange rate will be about one to one. And every point is one of these 22 banks, and the circle is the mean. You see there's quite a variability between them. So they might catch easily the real exchange rate, so the true exchange rate. What was it? Um, at the end of December 2001, it was lower than anyone predicted with one exception, Citibank, now Citigroup. And that was the last time in 10 years that Citigroup had a lucky estimate. Hmm? <laughs> now imagine you are one of these high paid analysts in Wall Street or in Frankfurt or at any place in the world. You were too high. What do you predict for next year? Now, here's what the analysts did. They went down. Hmm? And the exchange rate went up. <laughs> Note that it was outside of the entire range of prediction, which is between 20 and 25 cents, not trivial. Now, at the end of 2002, the predictions were made for 2003. Hmm? What would you predict? <laughs> Up. And that's what the analysts did. Hmm? What did the real exchange rate do? It was much farther up, second time, out of the entire range. Next year, same things happened. And the exchange rate was again outside of the range. By now, I think, you know what these secret mathematical models do. We do not know how these exchange rates are done because 
These are top secret because they are so good. <laughs> and the key is next year will be like last year. That's the key idea. So the, the, the predictions are always one year too late. <laughs> At this time, the prediction was, of course, it will go up further. The exchange rate went down. <laughs> then the analysts went down, and the exchange rate went up. But at least the first time, that's somewhere in the range. <laughs> and so it went up, but again, outside of the range. And then it went up, the exchange rate went down. This is the only hit, and also the last hit, in the entire 10 years. And then it, uh, predictions went down, up, and down, and so on. <laughs> what do you see here is a turkey illusion. It's the idea that you could use risk models to predict something that's in the domain of uncertainty. Why would companies and top managers buy these predictions, and why would we pay attention every year again? There are two answers. One is the top executives don't know how bad these predictions are. And that may be partially true because that what you see here, you probably have never seen before. And you guess why. Hmm? Second, there's a more interesting answer. Namely, the top executives feel quite well that there's not much in these predictions, but they buy them nevertheless. Why? It's defensive decision making. So if you yourself make a prediction, and it's wrong, you're responsible. But if JP Morgan made it, and it's wrong, you can say, it's not my fault, JP Morgan. So here we have an interesting mechanism in our society. At the one end, we have smart, mathematically gifted quants, hmm, whom we should have at the universities. But they get much more paid there. Hmm. So these quants produce, year after year, worthless predictions, and they refine the mathematical models with more free parameters, typically, which is the wrong thing to do anyhow. Okay. But these predictions are bought by top executives for dear money in order to protect themselves against being made accountable. So this is not the only process in our society that goes this way. Again. If we would be a little bit more risk savvy, we could understand all this and change our systems that we don't waste so much time and money in producing worthless predictions. The last financial crisis is also in part due to the application of standard mathematical probability models to a world of uncertainty. The uh, typical uh, models, such as value at risk, that uh, estimate the kind of uh, <clears throat> money that uh, banks need to hold, the capital, uh, have missed every crisis and prevented none. The, I'm working with the Bank of England on an alternative how to design simple heuristics that can make the world a safer place. And uh, that program helps us to uh, really to get rid of standard probability models which uh, create illusions of certainty. And uh, heuristics such as uh, a simple leverage ratio may be beginning to make the world a little bit more safer. In my first talk, I gave a, an overview about and an answer to the question, when should we use complicated mathematical models, and when is simplicity, simple heuristics, the more promising one? And the key features are, if you are in a world with low uncertainty, with, with just a few alternatives and lots of data, then 
aim for a complex solution, use big data. The example I gave was mean variance. So this is Markowitz mean variance portfolio. On the other hand, if uh, the situation you're dealing with has high uncertainty, many alternatives, and a small amount of data, then make it simple. Simple solutions, heuristics. In the example I gave, one over n. And in the real world of finance, uh, one over n mostly does better than the Nobel Prize winning optimization model. Now, let's apply this insight to a concrete problem. Assume you have a large company, an airline, an apparel retailer, or something else, a university. And um, you send uh, information and mail to your customers. And you may have a customer basis of 100,000 or a million. But you want to send this mail to active customers who will buy from you in the future and not to inactive customers who will never buy anything. Hmm? So lots of money is wasted on sending specific proposals to inactive customers. How can you find out which one in your large databases are inactive and or are still active? And it's a prediction. Say in a year. Again, there are two visions. One is, it's a complex problem. We need a complex solution. The complex solution in marketing science is called the Pareto negative binomial distribution model. Here's a short description. It amounts basically you have to estimate four parameters, make a number of distribution assumptions, and then calculate the probability that each customer will buy again. The alternative is, it's a complex problem. There's lots of degrees of uncertainty. Therefore, we need to look for a simple solution. Uh, one of the, the simple solutions here is the so-called hiatus heuristic, which is if a customer has not made a purchase for nine months or longer, classify the customer as inactive, otherwise as active. This is a heuristic of the class, one good reason. Everything else is ignored. Everything else that's in the Pareto negative binomial distribution model. Now, how well do these fare? I'll show you a study that has been conducted by two colleagues, two professors of economics, who were out to refute simple heuristics. And they chose a real problem, and here is the result. The result came to their surprise. They had three uh, problems, an airline and in the airline case, the complex model, the Pareto no negative binomial distribution, made 74% correct predictions, and the simple heuristic, 77. Note that the Pareto model has all the information the simple heuristic has and more. Nevertheless, simple is better. And the explanation I gave in my first lecture, it's the bias variance dilemma. In the apparel uh, case, the advantage of the simple heuristic was even better. And in the CD now, uh, that's a, an, an online CD, so the uh, predictions were exactly the same. At least you save yourself of all the computations. So here's an illustration. It's not the only one. Here are 20 studies of this kind who have looked at a complex model, multiple regression here, compared to one good reasoning, that's take the best, and one over n tallying. And what do you see here? The accuracy is, uh, if you look at data fitting, that means you know already the data and you fit your parameters on it, then complex models wins. But that's not of interest. It's not prediction. You know everything already. So in prediction, you see this interesting crossover. So one good reason and also one ON outperform. And I've added this heuristic, the minimalist, to show that less is more doesn't mean 
that no information is best. Huh? This one just picks any Q randomly. So that's basically what Einstein uh, is supposedly, has supposedly said once, yeah? make it as simple as possible, but not too simple. And that's the key idea here. In prediction, and this is cross-validation, yeah? uh, we do better to keep it simple because yeah? uh, the error that is called variance that comes in by estimating all these, what's weight and so on, is so big that its advantage is gone. So the insight here is a mind who is confronted typically with uncertainty as opposed to with worlds of risk. A mind needs to uh, run on simple heuristics to a certain degree. And that's what we call the adaptive toolbox. A mind that is designed only to run on Bayesian statistics or anything like that will fail. This insight is still something that we need to put into the minds of many of our smart colleagues. I give you three examples, and I hope that works. Uh, Dennis Lindley is one of the most famous Bayesian statisticians. He's no longer alive. He said once, the only good statistics is Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics is the only method that can produce sound inferences. Wrong. It is a very good method, maybe the best one in the world of known risk, but not under uncertainty. And what uh, Lindley is running prey here is, the illusion that all uncertainty can be reduced to risk. No businessman, you can't uh, do very well in uh, the problem I just saw or in the stock market with Bayesian statistics. One over N has been shown to do better than many Bayesian models in investment. The Bayesian models incur the same uh, estimation error as uh, multiple regression or Pareto negative binomial distribution. Here's a second quote. There is basically only one way to be rational. That's from the behavioral economist David Leibson, and I hope that David didn't mean that serious. But many economists mean it serious. There's only one method, and that's the expected utility maximization using Bayesian. Again, it's a confusion between uncertainty and risk. Under uncertainty, these methods are unknown how good they are, and simple heuristics typically can do better. And then there's a third example from the new field of neuroeconomics. And here's another dear colleague who is a very learned colleague, and I have high esteem of him, but he got it totally wrong. And I also say this not to criticize him, but maybe help this field of neuroeconomics get on the right track. So let's read that. If we as scholars, so Paul Klimscher writes, were to be so bold as to discard Friedman's as if assumption. Now, what is Friedman's as if assumption for the non-economists? Uh, Friedman, uh, in a famous paper together with Savage uh, in 1947 said, that this is now my rendering, we should not care about our assumptions that may be wrong. The only point is to make good prediction from wrong assumptions. That was a statement against psychology, basically saying that psychology isn't relevant. We don't need to care about how people make decisions of what's going on in our mind. We just make assumptions based on standard uh, probability theory and then somehow see that they come out right. That's the as if. And economists today, most of them stick to the as if philosophy. That means uh, you can't criticize an economist by saying your assumptions that the market is, that everyone knows everything in the market is reasonable, so this assumption is not reasonable, that doesn't matter. Because the economists will say, we just mean this as if. It's not. Yeah that we would ever think that's true. One way to understand this position is also like behaviorism, hmm? who doesn't care about what's going on in the mind. So, so if 
though what Klimschener proposes it, if we were so bold to discard Friedman's as if assumptions and instead hypothesize that the computations business billiards players and regular choosers appear to perform are actually being performed by the brains, then we gain something important. We gain the ability to test our economic theories with both neurobiological and behavioral tools. What Paul is doing here is he takes as if theories and reifies them as if they would be uh, computed in the brain. That's the first thing, problematic assumption. And the second one is that he doesn't pay attention to the difference between risk and uncertainty. A brain that has been evolved and can survive will not do the probability calculations all the time. It would be doomed. It needs to have smart heuristics. And neuroeconomics is not as far to realize that they're posing the wrong questions. So the question would be not whether to find uh, the components of the expected utility calculus, so values and, and probabilities in the brain. That's the wrong question. The question is, can we find traces of, it, of the adaptive toolbox in the brain? Hmm? And that's why I'm putting that here. And maybe it helps to get neuroeconomics to the right track. To illustrate once again the point about as if, probably the best known as if theory is Ptolemy's theory of heavenly bodies, of the movement of bodies. So we, Earth, are in the center. Everyone moves in circles around us. And the theory has not just circles, but epicircles. So you go this way and do that. Probably nobody believed that that's the actual movement of uh, heavenly planets, of planets. Hmm? But that it's as if. Now, reifying that, yeah? and Copernicus then came up with a, a process model, how it really might work hmm? without these epicircles. So what neuroeconomics seems to do is the following in this example. So you take Ptolemy as if and reify it as the real model of movement. And then you send out rockets or shuttles into space to find the epicycles. You always find some correlation with something in the brain, but you're interpreting it in the wrong way. So that's the danger. As a final example about the importance of the distinction of risk and uncertainty, I'll end with a humorous one, one that you all probably know, but there will be a twist on that. Remember the uh, TV show, Let's Make a Deal, uh, and the so-called Monty Hall problem. The Monty Hall problem uh, runs like that. So that's a picture of Monty Hall here. This is a contestant. And there are three doors. Behind one of these doors is a car, a Cadillac, for instance, and the other one are fun prizes, such a goat. The contestant picks one door, say door one. Monty offers her, Monty shows her, uh, he opens another door and shows her goat. He knows where the goats are. And now he offers her the possibility to switch. So do you want to stay with your door one or switch to two? Most people want to stay, and for various reasons. Usually they think it's a 50-50 chance, and I would regret it more if I would change. The uh, answer by probability theory is you have a two-third chance to win if you switch. You can see this very simple, in a simple way, by uh, that's basically natural frequencies. You don't think about the probability of a door. You just think about all counts. So assume here is the real car. And you uh, are here and want that door. Monty has to open this door. Switching wins. Clear? Second possibility, you stay in front of door two. Monty will randomly, that's also important, uh, open one of these twos. If you switch, you lose. Mm -hmm. And if you 
are in this store and open that one, then you uh, win again. So that is your two third. And that's so far most textbooks go with this problem. And here's the twist. You should now be able to see this is a problem of risk. Everything is certain. No surprises can ever happen. That's a rule. And one important assumption in this problem is that Monty always offers the candidate the opportunity to switch, or at least that he randomly does this independently of the door the candidate has chosen. So, for instance, if Monty would be mischievous and save the company money, he might only open, offer you to switch when you pick the right door. And then switching always is the worst thing, not the best thing. So the question is now, does the optimal solution in the Monty Hall problem transfer to the real game show? So that means if you would be in the real game show, should you switch? The answer is unknown. And I give you an example of what Monty actually said himself. So, first, Monty Hall, as far as we can reconstruct this, did not follow this procedure. And part of his personality was to be spontaneous, not to follow rules. Now, what he's saying, so there was the following situation. The contestant picked door one, as we just saw. Monty opens door three, as we just saw, revealing a goat. While the contestant thought about switching, now Monty pulled out a roll of bills and offered her $3,000 in cash not to switch. She said, I'll switch to it, and insisted on that. $3,000, Monty Hall repeated, cash, cash money. It could be a car, could be a goat, 4,000. The contestant resisted the temptation. I'll try the door. 4,500, 47, 48, my last offer, $5,000. Let's open the door. The contestant again rejected the offer. You just ended up with a goat, Monty Hall said, opening the door. And he explained, now do you see what happened there? The higher I got, the more you thought that the car was behind door two. I wanted to con you into switching there because I knew the car was behind one. That's the kind of thing I can do when I'm in control of the game. <laughs> Here we have the real world of uncertainty, where probability theory doesn't guarantee to find a good solution. In that case, it dooms you. And we have the same situation where the uh, contestant is standing in front, has chosen the right door, and Monty seduces her to switch, which is supposedly the right answer. So uh, the lesson is that the best answer in a world of risk is not necessarily the best answer in a world of uncertainty, say in the real show. Now, what could help this lady if you would have known the distance, the difference? Now, uh, there is a simple heuristic that's called minimax. Minimax means you avoid the worst outcome. That's a simple thing. What would be the worst outcome for her? L losing the $5,000 and also the car. So under that heuristic, you take the money, and you would have gotten the car in addition. Yeah. A second more difficult thing is use your own intuitions about what Monty might have in his mind when he's offering you this money and money. And you could intuitively feel what he's after. So the point I'm making is don't confuse a world of risk with a world of uncertainty. Second, we're doing too much studies, and not only in neuroeconomics, but in many other fields, where we construct worlds of certainty to our subjects, and then you measure their behavior, and then we infer that they would behave in this way 
in the real world. There's no point to make this. And worse, we often apply normative things to do, like switch, to uh, as if that would be a good norm in the real world. We need to dare to study uncertainty and not just cling on probability theory like a safety blanket. This brings me to the end. How to make good decisions? And I was focusing today on the difference between risk and uncertainty and, and the decisions under uncertainty. Yeah? So the best decision under risk is not the best decision under uncertainty. I think you got some examples. And also, it is very clear in the distinction. Nevertheless, uh, many smart probability theorists try to reduce all uncertainty to risk. I don't think that's a helpful move. Second, heuristics are indispensable. They are not the product of flawed mental systems. A heuristic is second best in a world where you can optimize, like in the world of risk, but not. You can make that point uh, and generalize this in the real world of uncertainty, where we typically live. So, and the, finally, complex problems do not always require complex solutions. We need to figure that out. And finally, more information, more time, and more computation is not always better. Less can be more. Thank you for your attention. You mentioned, you mentioned that in ter determining a heuristic, um, cues make a difference. Which cue yeah. you cho yeah. choose? How do you go about choosing the right cue? Yeah. So the uh, in in the examples I gave in my first lecture, uh, the cues are all known. So in 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 medical decision problems. Huh? Also in the example I gave here, the Pareto negative binomial distribution model has a number of cues among, yeah, and the simple heuristics, they have only part of these cues. That's their power. The point is that by estimating, by taking too many cues and trying to estimate the weights, uh, you may lose out by incurring more error, and a certain good bias can actually protect you against this error. But you said it makes a difference which of the many cues you settle on. Yes. The, uh, for instance, the, the fast and frugal trees I was talking the last time, uh, in order to, you can d design different trees with the same cues. And for instance, there is a paper, a psychological review paper by Shenghua Luan, uh, uh, Skula and myself, 2011, that explains how to design these trees. Do you think that our problems with probability and uncertainty stem from a lack of education that we receive in it, or more there's something about indeterminism that doesn't work with the way our minds work? Uh, I think if you mean the specific problems that there are many dear colleagues who believe that there's only one way to be rational, namely probability theory, and use it in some way, that's uh, rather a problem of a too narrow education. So you learn one tool, and everything looks like so. Like the old story about you have one hammer, everything looks like a nail. In this case, if you're Bayesian, you have one theory that's Bayesian theory, and every problem looks to you like a transformation of a posterior probability to a, for a, sorry. Every problem looks to you a transformation from a prior probability to a posterior probability, yeah? <laughs> and that I think is misusing a tool. These tools are important, but every attempt to reduce all tools to one has failed so far. It's the old Leibnizian dream that we would find the calculus that solves all our problems, and it's still in our minds. It doesn't work. Not even our body is designed to have one super organ who does everything, and there's a reason for that.
So uh, I had the good fortune, maybe, of sitting next to a meteorologist on a transcontinental flight 20 years ago. Okay, And so I really bore in on him on what does it mean when you give a certain percent chance of rain. Okay, And uh, there's all sorts of, I mean, you name some possibilities, but there's a, uh, and the one that was my default hypothesis was that uh, on 30% of the days like this, mm -hmm. okay, in the past it has rained, which then depends crucially on what the definition of a like this is, yeah. okay? Yeah. In addition, there's issues like uh, what's the granularity of the area? So in, mm -hmm. says it's 30% chance of rain in Santa Barbara, does that mean that there is a, that, that in 30% of days like this, 100% of Santa Barbara got wet by rain, okay? So what's the chance right here or where I care about? Is it going to rain? Can I get that from this information? Okay. And the more I asked the meteorologist, uh, he didn't know. He didn't know. Yeah. He, he has a statistical package. Yeah. And he, you know, he yeah. types in his questions and he yeah. gets out an answer. And he doesn't know the means by which this is computed. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he doesn't know uh, the boundaries on which, so, so in some abstract sense, it's not just getting experts to speak more clearly, but it, I think it's, I mean, yeah. I think it's clear that even the experts don't know. Yeah. They're falling back on a more uh, mm. uh, mm. intuitive sense of what they think things mean. Yeah. The code in some sense, procedural code, isn't commented, right, mm. uh, if you've ever been programming. But anyway, uh, but what do you think they mean when they say there's a 30% chance. <laughs> uh, John, your observation is on the point. This is also my experience, not only in meteorology, but with many experts. They have one of three problems, which is either they don't know the risk themselves, if you push them as you did, that's the case, or they know it, but they have no way to, to trans they don't know how to, how to make them understandable to others, or they may know it or not know it, but they have no interest because they have conflicting interests with yours. Yeah. That's a typical. On meteorology, we have uh, we published this paper on on the thirty percent chance of rain, and we have uh, interviewed a number of meteorologists along with the general public. And just give you one example: the Dutch meteorology, the Royal Dutch Meteorological Society, had a, an explanation on its website, which said. What does 30%, 50%, and 70% mean? And 30%, they wrote, it's uh, not so certain. <laughs> 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 and next to it, yeah, it will rain only in some parts of the Netherlands. 50%, it's more certain, and it will rain in half of the Netherlands. <laughs> so they mix together, and 70% are yeah, in most of the Netherlands and fairly so. So what do you do? But also, social psychologists have the same problem. Uh, we have done studies, for instance, and asked professors uh, of, of psychology and uh, those who teach statistics and their students, what does it mean if you have two groups and you test the, the means and then you find that they are significant at the 1% level. If you think that every professor of psychology knows what that means, no. So we have found that students who passed successfully two statistics groups, when we offered them a number of wrong answers, like it tells you the probability that the null hypothesis is wrong, it tells you the probability that the alternative hypothesis is right, it tells you about replicability or any other nonsense. So 100% of the students at least th thought that at least one of these wrong answers is true. On average, they thought that two to three are true. What's about the professors of psychology? 80% of them thought that at least one of the wrong, these illusions are true. And among those who teach psychology, I was really surprised, 60%. So no surprise that the students have illusions about p-values if those who write the textbooks don't understand it. And it's a long tradition from, from uh, yeah, Guilford, who didn't get it, he didn't get it right, huh? to Nunnally, 
Manali is a great book from 1975. It, p-values mean everything in his book. It's amazing to the present who nobody's really sure what it means. What does it mean, a p-value? It's a probability that this and that result or something more extreme happens if the null is true, nothing else. And we don't usually know whether the null is true. So it's not one of the most interesting probabilities. <laughs> Um, thank you for a great conclusion on risk versus uncertainty and heuristics and intuition. I'd like to go back to one of your uh, later uh, metaphors where you were uh, aggregating the bank uh, predictions for uh, exchange rates. Yeah. Uh, when you're advising your corporate or governmental clients, how do you handle the variation where you're going into a store and someone has their thumb on the scale while they're uh, putting their things out. Because as we know now, uh, several of the banks work together to rig the LIBOR rates where the banks themselves were not investing on the advice that they were giving the public and their clients because they had rigged the number which they knew was incorrect. Yeah. So you, you're doing all things being fair, honest, and equal. What, what happens when some of your data streams are deliberately deceptive? Yeah. And that may actually happen, and I wouldn't be surprised. So what I'm trying, for instance, the project with the Bank of England, we are trying to get away from risk models that calculate the capital a bank should hold, yeah? that are like value at risk, that are so complicated that there's no way to check whether they're done properly or not. And the bank, as you know, they have their own internal risk models. No central bank can check that. And a large bank may, to calculate value at risk, may have about a thousand parameters and a co, so in the order of thousands, a covariance matrix in the order of a million. So that's the parameters they need to estimate. So this, all of this borders on astrology. And we need to have the courage and study yeah, what simple heuristics can do something. Um, I was, as long as Mervyn King was uh, the uh, governor of the bank in England, um, I had asked him over dinner what he thinks, what set of simple heuristics would make the world safer. Mervyn said, basically start with one which is no leverage ratio above 10 to 1. So that's the depth to the capital. And, and an unweighted leverage ratio, which causes uh, many <laughs> bankers to stir, because you always can find reasons why what this overlooks. Yes, but just think what has happened with the other models. And at least one can see what's being done. And it's not so easy to cheat or to game uh, when things are simple. And that, that would be the real movement. What we have achieved so far is a, a speech by Andy Haldane uh, on the uh, Jackson Hole on, with the title um, The Dog and the Frisbee, another simple heuristic. And that Basel III people are using simplicity, but it's a tough game because there's so much interest and also so much delusion about big, big, big uh, so computations. So another example, um, I was giving the keynote to uh, a, a large investment company and um, who had their 500 or so clients there and uh, was explaining in more mathematical detail why simple can do better and when. It is the key issue is the ecological rationality worked it out. And uh, after the talk I gave uh, to Morningstar, uh, the, uh, they had a, a panel, so two of the top investors and myself. And the moderator asked the first top investor, Professor Gigerens just showed that simple can be better in this world of uncertainty. You are known for your complex models. What do you say now? Now everyone was waiting whose blood is being shed. <laughs> and the investor said, 
to my surprise, I have to admit I often do one over n, so investing. <laughs> and he had never said this before. Then after this, uh, <laughs> this panel, the head of a large investment firm came up to me, and the head of the, uh, of the uh, investment sector of it, of an of a, uh, insurance firm, and he said, I'll check what you said with our own investments. And three weeks later, he came to Berlin in my office with his top computer specialist and said, we checked our investments from 96 till today. And we used 1 over N and did some rebalancing. And he said, we would have made more money than compared to the, to the method they bought. So the, the sealed black boxes with this great algorithm. So he said, I'm now convinced, but, and I think of um, so issuing a heuristic fund, but he said, here is my problem. How can we explain this to our customers? They might say, I can do this myself. I tried to calm him down and said, and there are lots of questions that are unresolved, like how big N is, what the unit of N is, and the entire issue about the rebalancing method. But that is just to show you that's part of the game, and that never at the end worked out. Because part of the game is to present methods that are very complicated in a world of uncertainty where they don't work. I'm sure many of you have some other questions. We're lucky to have Eric Digger here for a while. So uh, I'd like to thank him for his talk. Yeah. Thank you.